before. I know a few of your faces look familiar. For those of you that have heard me, thanks for coming back. Sorry that you have to set through it again. Um, for those of you that haven't heard me, I'm so glad that you're here to, to be with myself and with Chief Gammon. We have been going um, from college to college to police station, campus police to campus police, talking to, educating, advocating for sexual assault on a college campus. So before I launch in and explain to you what's going on on a college campus with sexual assault, I need to tell you a little bit about me so that you can see that maybe I have just a little bit of credibility to talk to you about sexual assault and what it does to you and what it does to your brain and um, the trauma that it creates and the lifelong um, effects that you can have from it. So I'm fighting a really bad cold, you guys. So if I sound like um, a seventh grade boy going through puberty, just, just bear with me. <clears throat> when it gets really bad, I'll hand it over to Chief Gammon and he'll take over for me. So courage starts with you. That's my, um, he's already trying to run my show for me. That's my logo. Um, never in a million years did I think I would have a logo. What, how would someone like me end up with their own logo? Just, just isn't gonna happen. But I'm so thrilled to say that that is my logo. Um, I have my own logo, I have my own website, and I have my own 501c3. Those are things that I never thought would go with my name in any, in any fashion at all. I've spent my life in the medical field, and I have a lot of titles in the medical field, but certainly none of these. So let me tell you why that's such a big deal to be standing here in front of you with a logo and to have the privilege to talk to you. By the way, I want you to stop me at any time if you have a question. You don't have to wait. If you're like me, I would forget the question by the time it got to the appropriate time. So just holler at me and we'll stop and get it answered. There's absolutely nothing that you can ask me that will embarrass me, that will um, humiliate me, that will cause me to be sad. Not gonna happen. I do wanna give you one little warning. I often hear back from students that when they listen to my story, I trigger their story. If you find yourself triggered today, don't, don't leave upset. If you have to leave, feel free to step out. But if you find yourself a little triggered by my story, hang around and let's talk about it, okay? And let's kind of work through it and see where you're at and see if there's something I can do to help. Because I am a little bit of a trigger for people that have been sexually assaulted. So six years ago, <clears throat> I was in my, I live part-time in Kansas City, Missouri, Kansas City, Kansas, and part-time in Corpus Christi, Texas. Um, Corpus Christi, Texas, I suppose is technically my home, but I'm from Kansas City. And when I moved to Corpus Christi, I didn't have twin grandbabies in Kansas City, but now I do. So now I'm like a gypsy and I shuffle back and forth between them. But six years ago, I moved to Corpus Christi and uh, my husband took a job there. It was devastating for me. I did not do well. My brain does not do well with change at all. And things got really, really dark to a very dark place in my life. I have complex PTSD. And so I decided that there were things worse than living, things worse than dying. And living at that point was worse than dying for me. And I couldn't get myself under control. I couldn't get my symptoms under control. So I set out with a plan. And I've spent my life in the medical field. I'm, I have a medical background. So I set out to do everything I needed to do to make all this madness in my head stop. I bought a cemetery plot. I bought the clothes that I wanted to be buried in. I planned out the music. I planned out the service. And I had enough pills to do the job. And that was it. I was done. I, was, I couldn't do it anymore. Couldn't, I'd spent my life fighting and I couldn't fight for another breath. So for reasons that, that is a long, another long story to get into, um, some things happened in that time. I, I knew enough to be on the linoleum and not on the carpet. I didn't, I didn't wanna leave blood. I didn't want my husband to have that mess to clean up. So that was my plan. And I had every intentions of following through with that. A couple of things happened in a, in a little span of time. And by the grace of God, that didn't happen. And my life began to change and I began to work really hard to, to go another, another round of therapy and another new therapist, more cutting edge therapy. I started EMDR, 
um, which is a uh, rapid eye movement therapy. They were changing some things from one side of my brain to the other. And I began to see the daylight again. And I began to heal again, only this time really, really heal. And when I moved to Corpus Christi, I didn't realize that in the salt water and in the salt air, there's a healing property that's very, very good for your brain. So I had that environment to be in. I started working in San Antonio with a um, really high profile therapist and we started digging in and doing some work. And from that moment at six years ago, when I decided to end my life, till it's been about two years ago that I really started speaking and it's been the last year that I've really started speaking with Chief Gammon and we've partnered up and we've started going from college to college. So having a logo is kind of a big deal from the girl who had all the pills laid out and um, I still have that cemetery plot. Apparently those are non-refundable, you buy it, it's yours. Um, so that's why I'm really proud to tell you that I do have my own logo and I am my 501c3 um, because I came from having my face flat down on the ground checking out of this world. So let me tell you about me. <clears throat> this is what we're going to do today. We're going to understand who I am and why I get to stand here before you. We're going to understand um, statistics of sexual assault. We're going to talk about prevention tips. We're going to talk about um, offender consequences, and then we'll answer any questions that you guys have. So my abuser was my father. My abuse started when I was about six or seven years old. <clears throat> Can you change it for me, please? The girl on the left, that's the girl who started with her abuse. That's about how old I was. A lot of decisions that I make today, I think, well, why did I do that when I was a kid? And why, did I, why didn't I do this? Or why did I do that? And I have to stop and tell myself that I didn't have this adult brain. That's the brain I had. So the decisions that I was making, that little girl was making. So my father was extremely abusive, extremely. He was um, verbally, physically, mentally, emotionally, um, sexually, every kind of abuse you can imagine. That was my father. He was a, not a kind man in any form or fashion. I have two siblings. I have a sister that's two years younger than me, and I have a brother that's nine years younger than me. My siblings were also abused, except my brother was not sexually assaulted. Um, our abuse was frequent. My abuse was often. It was weekly, if not more. My emotional and, and mental and verbal, those were daily. That, that was an everyday part of my life. The physical abuse, um, you never knew when that was going to come. The sexual abuse was at least once a week, often more than that. My mother, to this day, swears that she did not know. I don't, my therapist says she does. Uh, that's between my mother and, and her um, conscience. I, I can't. I, don't, I can't speak for her. So my father told me to never tell anyone, and I never did. It never, ever occurred to me that I could tell someone. There was no one coming to my school saying, if someone's touching you inappropriately, you can tell somebody. No one talked about it. Now, I was about six or seven, and I'm 56. So 50 years ago, we weren't talking about it. But you know what, guys? We're still not talking about it. So we haven't made a lot of ground in 50 years, but we're trying. Um, so my abuse continued until it, it got to the point that I became a runaway. And I lived in a very small town, and every time I would run away, the police would always find me and they would always take me back. Never did they say, Sherry, is something wrong? Um, can we help? Do you have a problem? They just always took me back, gave me back to my parents, which then ensued in another beating from my father. So I didn't know, I got really desperate and I didn't know how to get out of my situation. <clears throat> so I devised a plan. I was a senior in high school and I decided that if I got married, um, that my abuse would stop. So when I was a senior in high school, I was 17 years old. I was dating a guy that was nice. He was not the love of my life. I'm not sure he was even any love, but he was a way out. Um, I'm not proud to tell you that. But I will tell you that um, when you're looking, when you're working in survival mode, you'll do just about anything to survive. So that's me when I was 17 years old and I got married to get away from my father. 
Physically, yes, I removed myself from my father, but my um, traumatized brain stayed with me everywhere that I went. So I'm not sure what slide is next. Will you show me? Oh, okay, back it up, please. Um, so my, I get married and my plan was <clears throat> that I was gonna go to college and move as far away from my family as I possibly could. I was gonna stay married until I graduated high school and then I was out. Well, what I didn't take into account or what I didn't even consider in my broken brain was the possibility that I would have a baby. And I'd been married about nine months and I had a baby. So I didn't have an option. I had lost my, my chance to go to college because I was pregnant and I couldn't make a, I couldn't take care of myself and a small child. So I just stayed with this man. Um, I didn't know what else to do. And he was nice. And from the outside looking in, people thought we had a perfect family. So I ended up having a total of three children. I have um, two daughters and my son is the oldest. My son is six years older than my daughter and then my daughters are two years apart. So, so life went on and my abuse and my trauma was locked up in the back of my brain and I didn't know who I was, but I knew how to be a mom. And, and every day that's the face that I put on was to be a mom. I was married to the most popular teacher and coach in this little town of 2000 people and life went on. So one day I was having lunch with a friend and I was 32 years old and she said, um, Sherry, I know. And I said, you know what? And she said, I know about your dad. I have no idea to this day how she knew, and we're still friends. Um, I cried, she cried, and then we agreed to never ever speak of it again. That was it. I was never, no one else knew. I wasn't going to tell anybody else. And that was all fine and good, except for what I had kept in this neat little box for all of these years now didn't go back. It wouldn't go back where I had kept it. It was open, the box was open and all the emotions and all the trauma and all that, the, the afterfall was just out. So I kind of began in a little tailspin and I found a therapist. So I started seeing a therapist and I started working really hard with her. And she said, you know, do you know that you have complex PTSD? No, I didn't know that. And do you know that you have a timeline? They, they, make, me, may, they make you do a timeline. Do you know you have a timeline worse than any timeline I've ever seen? No, I didn't know that. So I worked very hard with this therapist. And while I was trying to get better, um, my husband at the time was resisting everything I was doing because people don't like it when we change. They like us to stay unhealthy because they know that person. This person that I was trying to become, he didn't know. So I'm trying to get better and he's kind of spinning out of control. So when I was 32 and my friend asked me about my father and, and I kind of started therapy, my sister and I went to my mother and we told her about our father. And in turn, my, my mother went to my father and he said, it's absolutely the truth. Everything, she's, everything they're telling you is the truth. So my mom left my father. And I was elated because I thought for the, finally, for the first time ever, I'm going to have a relationship with my mom. Finally. Almost 24 hours to the minute later, my mom called me and she said, I just wanted to tell you that I've been on the phone with your dad and he said he's very sorry. And so I'm going home. And that was the end of my relationship with my mom. So... My sister is a drug addict she, and an alcoholic. My brother is a drug addict and an alcoholic. My sister went to therapy once. She, during that time, she went to see my therapist. The next day, she called me and she said, I need you to come and get me. And I said, okay. So I went to get her. I said, where are we going? And she had had a complete mental breakdown. I took her to a mental hospital and she stayed there for about a month because she went to therapy one time. She never, ever went to therapy again. Um, to this day, she's a drug addict. My brother is a drug addict. 
um, they haven't raised their children, they don't hold jobs, um, they aren't really productive members of society. So, <clears throat> so my mom, I, so I don't have a relationship with my parents because my mom has decided to go back to my dad. I don't have a relationship with my siblings because they're off doing whatever it is that drug addicts do, um, oftentimes gone for weeks and months at a time. So my husband is doing everything wrong that my therapist is asking him to do. Um, he won't stop touching me. He won't stop accusing me of having affairs. He's doing everything he can to undermine my recovery. So I, was, I told my therapist about this and she said, I want you to give him a card. I want you to give him this card and I want him to see this person. They specialize in dealing with spouses of people who have lived the kind of trauma that you've lived. It will help him understand what you're going through. And I said, okay. So I was so excited. And my therapist was two hours from this little town that I lived in. So I drove all the way home, all the drive back home. I was so excited to give him this card so that he could maybe begin to understand and he would stop trying to um, handicap me in my recovery. So I walked in my kitchen and, and I said, I'm so excited. Marilyn wants me to give you this card. And I told him what it was and I'm hand holding the card out. And he jerked his hand back and he said, I'm not seeing anybody, I'm not the crazy one. And I said, okay. And so the physical abuse from my husband escalated, the mental abuse escalated, the accusations escalated. And finally, I knew that I either had to step away from him and get my healing under control, or I wasn't gonna heal at all. I was in the middle of a huge emotional breakdown. And I had to stop driving my car because I couldn't remember where the brakes were. I know, I know what that sounds like to tell you guys that. Um, I could not take a drink of water out of a glass because I was convinced that I would drown in that glass of water. I know, I know what it sounds like. I hear it coming out of my mouth, but that's what trauma does to your brain. So there was a little house about a block that became for rent in this little town of 2,000 people. So I thought, well, if I rented that house for about a month, I could maybe get myself together. And my goal was to get, my son was already graduated. My goal was to get my daughters through high school so that I didn't disrupt their lives. So I moved down, only took my, I worked for a doctor's office. Um, I worked for a doctor's office in the daytime and at night I worked the ambulance as an EMT. So I just took my scrubs and stuff. I was gonna stay a month and then I was going home. I'd been down at my little house for two days and I came home from lunch at the doctor's office and the chief of police was waiting in my driveway. Well, I know him very well because I'm an EMT and oftentimes when we would have a call, he would either ride with us or he would meet us at the scene and we work together on, in a professional manner. And I thought, that's odd, I wonder what Lyle's doing here. So I get out of my car and Lyle gets out of his car and he walks up to me and he says, um, Sherry, I'm really sorry. And he hands me a packet. And I thought, that's odd, what, I don't know what he's giving me. And he got in his police car and drove away and I went into my little house that had not a stick of furniture in it, you guys, not a refrigerator, no stove, no nothing. Um, I had a little styrofoam cooler that, that I kept milk in and stuff for my girls. So I go in my house and I'm so curious, I open this up and it's divorce papers. We had never talked about divorce. I didn't know he wanted a divorce, but I got served divorce papers. So I kind of tried to get myself together and I thought, well, I better go get some money. So I get in my car and I drive to the bank and it's a town of 2000 people. And of course I know the teller and I went in and I said, hi, Jamie. And she said, hi, Sherry. And I said, I'd like to draw some money out. And she looked at me and she said, I'm really sorry, but he's already been here and there isn't any money. And I said, okay. So I went to my car and I sat in my car and I got my wallet out and I started counting my money. And I had $8.32, and that was it. And I had no siblings, and I had no parents, and I had no husband, and I had no one. No one, except for two daughters that needed me. And I was in the middle of a massive meltdown. And I didn't, there was no way out. Dark, it was, there was black everywhere. I didn't know how I was going to feed my children. Um, we ended up going to divorce court. We were granted 50-50 custody of our children. 
which meant there was no child support. And even though I'd been married for 25 years, there was no alimony, not a penny. So I worked from eight to five at the doctor's office. And then I would take the 5P to 5A on the ambulance. So I was working almost 24 hours a day trying to support my children. My family doesn't have much to do with me, very little to do with me. Um, to this day, I've never spoken to my children's father about a divorce. Just got my, I have a friend that laughs and says, you're the only person I know that got a divorce without ever talking about it. Um, he was convinced that I was having numerous affairs. And if you've ever lived in a little town, you'll, you know that um, the truth and the details are insignificant. If they don't know the truth and they don't know the details, they'll just make them up as they go. So I was the horrible person that was ostracized. I lost every friendship. I lost everything. So I worked really hard, really hard to um, keep myself alive, literally, for my children and be the kind of mom that they needed me to be and be the best mom that I could be for them. And we had been living on our own, my girls and I, for about three years. And I had um, a girlfriend, a long distance girlfriend that said, um, do you really have to start getting out? And I said, I, I, I'm not getting out, but hey, thanks for your advice. And so she said, why don't you do online dating? Okay, now keep in mind, this is 15 years ago. Online dating was not um, acceptable. There was nothing but pedophiles and mass murders on online dating. So I met this really nice guy and he asked me to go to dinner and he lived a couple of hours from me. So about a year later, I got married to this man. And before I ever went on my first date with him, I told him about my abuse. I told him about my father. I told him about my children's father. I told him everything. And he said, okay. I'm good with that. Now, we struggle a little bit because in the beginning, he just wanted to fix it. Whatever it was, I'll just fix it because that's what he does by trade. He just fixes things. But you can't fix a broken brain. You can work on it and you can heal it, but you really can't fix it. So having said all of that, um, that brings you to the point after I got, my, after I got over my last suicide attempt, which I have never been suicidal since, um, that brings me to you guys today. And that brings me to college campuses to tell my story, um, even though it's ridden with guilt and shame, it's taken me a very long time to be able to tell my story. Statistically, only 3% of us that have been sexually abused can stand up in front of someone and tell our story because the guilt and the shame are so deep um, it takes us a very long time to recognize that it wasn't my fault. Um, that little girl, that little six year and seven year old girl didn't have a choice. Um, my father is dead now, by the way, and my mother is um, not particularly happy that I'm here today talking to you or anyone for that matter. She would like me to be very still and very quiet. She does not like for me to tell my story. Um, it makes her very angry. And she thinks that by telling my story that I choose to continue to live in my past. That's not what I'm doing, but we come from completely different sides of the spectrum. So, so having told you my story, um, one in four women, statistically it was one in five, they're now moving it to one in four. One in four of us are sexually abused and assaulted, perhaps not all by our fathers. Um, so I know that I'm not alone. And I know that we've spent years not talking about it, and it hasn't got us nowhere. So now that you know a little bit about me, and I might have a thimble full of credibility to stand here and talk to you, let's talk about what's going on in the colleges today. Oh, this was the first time I gave my testimony. This was about five years ago. Um, I couldn't speak the words. I don't like to look at that picture. I don't particularly like that girl in that picture. Um, that was a cardboard testimony, and all you do is the front of it says where you were, and then you flip your card over in the back, says where you are now. Um, at the time, I was not speaking at colleges yet, but I do have a homeless mission in um, Corpus Christi every Thursday night. I go to the streets 
and work with homeless women. Corpus Christi has, a, um, the weather is very conducive to homelessness. We have a lot of runaway girls and the city of Corpus Christi and the police in Corpus Christi like to move them out of the public's view. Um, and they often tell me that they don't know why I spend my time because they're just runaways. To which I always love to tell them, when someone's running away, they're not running to something. We're running from something. So if you're working with someone that's a runaway, think about what they're running from. So this is where I've kind of been. Um, the, the poster on the left, that was a girls' conference that I did. Um, I think I had about 500 high school girls. It's called It's a Girl Thing. Um, I'm a speaker for RAIN. I hope all of you guys know about RAIN. This is what I've been through in the middle, and this is where I am now. <clears throat> I have a little video that I want you guys to watch. It's just a couple of minutes long. I never thought I'd be the one out of four women to be sexually assaulted in college. I'm so independent and strong, but here I am feeling like a statistic. I regret not reporting my sexual assault to my campus police officers. Now I get to see the man who did it every day, getting away with it. Since I was sexually assaulted, I have no motivation for anything. Graduating college has been my dream since I was eight. Now I just don't care anymore. Just another thing he took from me. I moved an hour away to a new college for a new start, and I was sexually assaulted by a friend in the first three months. I was sexually assaulted by my roommate in college. My best friend knows he's still friends with her. I'm a gay guy in college, and a few months ago I was sexually assaulted by another guy. I haven't told anyone. I'm scared he'll do it again. I was sexually assaulted at college. Nobody believes me. Not even my own parents believe me. I was sexually assaulted in college. I thought I was able to make peace with it, but last night I had a dream I was raped again. Now I can't stop shaking and crying. I'm going to be sick. I was sexually assaulted while under the influence by someone I trusted during my first semester of college. Because I haven't found the right way to cope, I either isolate myself or have sex too fast. I can't tell my mom that I was sexually assaulted here in college because she has enough to worry about back home, 700 miles away. After I was sexually assaulted in college, my boyfriend at the time cheated on me because he said he should get to sleep with someone else too. I was sexually assaulted in college four years ago. I still get panic at times when I'm near men I don't know. So if we're gonna talk about sexual assault in a college, the first thing we have to do is be able to come to an agreement about what sexual assault is. And for as many of us as are in here today, if we took a poll and I asked you what sexual assault was to you, for as many as of you as are in here, that's how many different definitions we would get of sexual assault. Because we all think of something different for sexual assault. So we're gonna work off of the legal definition of sexual assault. <clears throat> the legal definition is any sexual activity that occurs against a, a person's will. It involves situations in which the victim does not or cannot consent to a sexual activity. So to begin with, I have to be able to say yes, or it's sexual assault. Now, what if I'm incapacitated and I cannot say yes, but I don't say no? Still assault, right? Absolutely. If I don't have the ability to say no, it's assault. If I don't have the ability to say yes, it's assault. <clears throat> oh, will you back up just a second for me, please? Um, I want you to notice some of the other types of sexual assault. And I want you to go down to the number three um, line at the bottom where it says forced penetration. When, when I ask students what sexual assault is, that's the answer that I get from them. Forced penetration. You're right, that is sexual assault. But what about grabbing, touching, stroking, harassment, um, date rape drugs, unwanted advances? Those are all sexual assault too. Okay, so I want you to remember that it's not just forced penetration, it's so much more than that, it's so much broader than that. Here's what we know about sexual assault on a college campus. We know that one in four women, one in four of us, are sexually assaulted on a college campus. 
We know that 43% of students reported they witnessed a drunken person headed for a sexual encounter, and that 25% of them said they did nothing because they didn't know what to do. Oh, you guys, if we don't know what to do, we got a problem. We know that 75% of bystanders indicated they did nothing. Now, you guys know what bystander intervention is, right? You've learned about bystander intervention. When is a person more likely to step up and do something with bystander intervention? Am I more likely to step up if I'm in a group of people, or am I more likely to step up when I'm by myself? Anybody? Group? Who thinks group? Who thinks by myself? We're more likely to do something if we're by ourselves. And the reason why is if I'm in this, if I'm with this group of people and all of us are watching this um, encounter go down, but we all know it's not right, I think he's gonna do something, he thinks they're gonna do something, they think she's gonna do something, and in fact, nobody does anything. But if it's just me and I'm the only one watching, I can't depend on somebody else. I have to do something myself. So bystander intervention, the more people there are around, the more the, the, the rate for getting help plummets, okay? 63% of respondents believe campus officials would not take their report of sexual assault seriously. And 50% of victims of even the most serious incidents, forced penetration, said they did not report the event because they did not think it was serious enough. So if 50% of us do not think that forced penetration is serious enough, we have a huge problem. Where's your self-worth? You are serious enough. It, you are worthy enough. And if no one has ever told you that you're not more worthy than to be sexually penetrated, then let me tell you, you are better than that. You are more important than that. Now, will you back up for me just a second, please? See where it says 63% of respondents believed campus officials would not take their report seriously? That may be at a lot of colleges, and I'm not going to stand here and tell you I've been to every college in the U.S., but I've been to eight or ten colleges in Georgia, and I'm going to tell you that every college in Georgia that I've been to, I guarantee you the police officers are going to take your report seriously. I promise you that if you go to Lieutenant Coleman and you say, I've been sexually assaulted, she is going to believe you until you've given her a hundred reasons not to believe you. At East Georgia, tell me what it is, East Georgia State in Swainsboro, Chief Gammon's campus, I guarantee you, he's going to take your report seriously. And yesterday we were doing a, a group of RAs and, and he was talking to them and telling, assuring them that we at our college take this seriously. And I heard him say, in fact, if you report to any of my officers and they don't take you seriously, I will fire them on the spot. Whoa, that's serious. And I don't, not heard Lieutenant Coleman say that, but I kind of think the same thing from her. If someone did not believe you, they wouldn't have a job very long. So I can't tell you about other colleges, but I can tell you about the colleges that I've been to, and that's how they work. <clears throat> Sexual assault has absolutely nothing to do with what you're wearing. Nothing. I don't care how short your skirt is. I don't care how low your top is. has nothing to do with what you're wearing. What is sexual assault and rape about? Power. Absolutely, it's about power. has nothing to do with what you're wearing. If we go with the theory that sexual assault has to do with what you're wearing, then in my brain, in the summertime, when we all have our bikinis on, well, not we all, but you all, um, so we have less clothing on, the rate of sexual assault would skyrocket because we're, we're dressed more provocatively. But, but rape doesn't go up in the summertime because we're all in our swimsuits. So how can it possibly have anything to do with what you're wearing? Now, <clears throat> I want to stop a minute and I want to tell you that if you go to your campus police, if you go to Lieutenant Coleman, you go to Chief Gammon, and you say, I need to tell you I've been sexually assaulted, they may very well say to you, I need to know what you were wearing. But I want you to know that the tone is not, 
Oh, really? And what were you wearing? That's not the tone. The tone is, I need you to tell me what you were wearing. Any idea why? Absolutely. He, Lieutenant Coleman, Chief Gammon, need to know what I was wearing. I had on a dress, I had on pantyhose, I had on a bra and panties. Four articles of clothing. That's what they know they're gonna look for. So if you report a sexual assault and they ask you what you were wearing, I want you to know that it's not in a condescending manner. It's in a manner to educate them and it's in a manner so that they can help you with your case because that's their goal now is to help you with your case. I also want you guys to think about this. I know that most, most everybody is an RA, right? That's in here. <clears throat> think about your relationship to the students that are in your dorms. You're important to them. You're, um, a, um, my, sometimes my trauma brain, you guys, words just leave, but it'll come back. You're someone that they respect. They look up to. They maybe idolize you. You may be the first person that when they get assaulted in a dorm room and they stumble out of that dorm room, you may be the very first person they see. You need to know what your job is, what your responsibility is, what are the right things for you to say when you have that student that comes to you and confides in you. Do you know what to say? Do you know what not to say? Oh, you guys, you're the first, you're about the first line of, of of, of um, that the that the victim's going to see, so we need to make sure that you know what's appropriate to say to that victim when she or he and I use the word she, but please remember that one in sixteen males are assaulted on a college. I just use she because I'm often referring to myself. So if I come stumbling out of my room, you can see that I'm my face is bloody, my clothes are torn, and and I stumble upon, you're the first person that I see. Well, tell me something that you can say to me. Tell me something you shouldn't say to me. I'll work either way with you. Perfect, what happened? Are you okay? Tell me something not to say. Excellent. I want you to do everything you can to keep that person from showering. Because the very first thing we want to do when we've been sexually assaulted is what? Take a shower. I want these clothes off if they're still left on me and I want to shower. So you as an RA need to convince, do everything in your power to convince that person not to do that. What if they're bleeding? What if we need medical help? Absolutely. I would love for that to be your first call. He said call the police if you didn't hear him. Have a police officer, Lieutenant Coleman's number, some police office number, the, the central line, whatever, in your phone. Because I guarantee you, when that victim comes to you and says, I was just sexually assaulted, and you're going to say, oh my gosh, what was it that crazy blonde head lady told me to do? Oh yeah, call the police. Oh, I wonder what the number is. Let me Google that. Uh-uh. You don't have, you have split seconds to work. Have that number in your phone. Tell that person, I'm, let me call Lieutenant Coleman. I'm not sure what to do, but let me call Lieutenant Coleman. She can get an ambulance here. She can get you the help that you need. Don't take a shower. I'm going to stay with you. The one thing that I do not ever want you to say, it's something condescending like, um, what were you doing in there? or have you been drinking? Or I thought he used to be your boyfriend. I want you to make sure you tell that victim you believe them until they've given you a hundred reasons not to believe them. I want you to believe them. I want you to know that the national statistic for false reporting is from 2% to 8%. So the FBI puts it at about 5%, which puts false reporting of a sexual abuse the same as any other false reporting, whether it's a robbery or a car theft or whatever, shoplifting, whatever. So it's very, very, very small. Does it happen? Sure, it happens. 
but it's so tiny and so minute. <clears throat> we know that in the last five years, sexual assault on a college campus has increased 1,000%. Let that sink in a minute. 1,000% in five years. We know that one in five, I have contradicting information. My other slide says one in four, that's talking about undergraduates, this one's, but they're also changing it. Rain is changing it to one in four. One in four women will be assaulted in their college career and one in 16 males. <clears throat> I'm not sure why that's in there redundantly. This slide makes me really angry. One in six males will be sexually abused by the time he's 18. But look what happens when that male decides to go to college and better himself. He's five times more likely to be abused than a non-student. So you make the decision to go to college, you get the finances, you do the hard work, you want a job, you want to better yourself, you want to better for your family, you go to college, and now you're five times more likely to be sexually assaulted. We know that 60% of college assaults happen in a residence hall. That's every one of yours watch. 60% is happening on your watch. That's why we've got to make you know what to do and what not to do. We know that 70% of sexual assault victims know their abuser. So growing up, we were always told that um, to stay away from that guy in the van handing out free candy. That's not the abuser, you guys. We know our abusers. It's either a family member, it's an ex-boyfriend, it's a roommate, it's a person that you met at a party, or that you knew from a party, it's someone that you know. The myth that it's someone, some creepy stranger in a van, it's simply not the truth. We know that 95% of sexual assaults on a college campus go unreported. 95%. So why are we not reporting, you guys? I think somebody said something, but I didn't hear it. Absolutely. Terrified. What else? Yes. Can you think of anything else? You are spot on. That's about the biggest fear that I'm not going to be believed. Who said that? You're right. And we've seen that, haven't we? So why am I going to put myself through that when my friend did and absolutely nothing happened? But that's what Lieutenant Coleman is trying to change. That's what Chief Gammon is trying to change. That's what I'm trying to change so that that does not happen. I know that's what's happened in the past, and I know that we also haven't talked about it in the past. Because let's just get real. It makes us uncomfortable to talk about sexual assault. Does it make it any less prevalent? No. So we've tried not talking about it, and it's increased a thousand percent in five years. I think we better start talking about it, even if it makes us uncomfortable. When asked college-age victims why they didn't report to law enforcement, 26% said they believed it was personal. 20% had a fear of reprisal. 12% didn't think it was important enough to report. That circles right back around to the self-worth that I was talking to you guys about. You are important enough. Your body is your body, and it is important enough. 9% believe the police would not or could not do anything to help. Perhaps that's been the case. But let me tell you, in South Georgia, we're working to change that. This college is working to change that because Lieutenant Coleman has a passion and a desire to change that. Chief Gammon's college is changing that because that's his desire to change that. Nine out of 10 rapes on a college campus are perpetrated by repeat offenders. The average college rapist will rape six times. So 
what if I'm the first victim and I don't tell? We know that statistically there are going to be five more victims behind me. But let's say that I'm the first victim and Lieutenant Coleman is empowering me to tell somebody. Do I have the chance to save five people behind me? Absolutely. If I can find the courage to speak, I have the chance to save the next five people behind me. Research tells us that 90% of the rapes are committed by 3% of the men. Only 3%, you guys. We can stop the 3%. Think about that. What if you only had to make 3% of your basketball shots? Anybody can do that. I can make 3% of basketball shots. Together, we can stop the 3%. Statistically, that tells me that 97% of the guys in a college setting have a chance to be a hero. You are a hero. But we're all taking a bad rap. All the guys and girls are taking a bad rap for 3% of the guys doing the college rapes. That's why we've got to keep our eyes open. Lieutenant Coleman cannot be everywhere. <clears throat> you have to keep your eyes open and your ears open. Watch out for your friend. Watch your drink. You guys know all of those things to do. <clears throat> oh, Chief Gammon's turn. I can get a drink of water. Let me turn my mic off. How many folks that have not heard us talk before know what the red zone is? Familiar with it? Anybody? The red zone is the time of year when a sexual assault on a college campus is most likely to occur. Now, when is the red zone? It's from the beginning of fall semester until the Thanksgiving break. That's the red zone. More sexual assaults will happen during that red zone than any other time of year. Now, they will happen all during the year, but they're much more prevalent <clears throat> during that red zone. Why is that? Well, first, that's when all the new incoming freshmen hit campus. It may be the first time they've been away from mom and dad. It may be the first time that they've had the freedom to come and go without having to tell someone. They may not have the experience that the upperclassmen have with alcohol. They may not know what their tolerance for it is because they're still underage. They are fresh meat on campus for the predators. What else do we have in that time frame? The fall sports, football. We have tailgating parties. We have watching parties at fraternities and sorority houses that have free-flowing alcohol, okay? All of those things combine during that red zone that cause the sexual assault rate to skyrocket during the red zone. Now, you saw a previous slide that said rape, college rapes go, have gone up 1,000% in the last five years. If that's a true statement, then why do 89% of college campuses all across the country have zero reports on their Clary report? How does it go up 1,000% and yet 89% of all colleges have zero? Well, there's a couple of different factors that cause that. Number one, underreporting. Folks not reporting that they've been assaulted for any of the reasons that you gave. Fear of reprisal, afraid they won't be believed, the shame, the guilt, they don't want to tell anyone. All of those contribute. But also what contributes to that are the school administration that they don't want real numbers on there. They want zeros because parents 
think that's a safer campus if it has a zero. If there are three assaults reported on a given campus, they're afraid they're gonna lose students, which means they lose tuition, they lose fees, their budget drops. They may have to lay people off, they think, because a, a real number up there will devastate our college budget. We just couldn't take that. I'm here to tell you that as a parent of two college age boys, that's the campus I want my kids to go to. It's one that puts up real numbers. Because if you see real numbers up there, that's a campus that takes it seriously. That's a campus that says, we know there's a problem and we're doing something about it. We're proactive. We're not gonna put a false number up there knowing we have assaults occurring on the campus and we're gonna let these students come in here and blindly think they're on a safe campus. No, as a parent, that campus that puts up real numbers, they're the ones that are doing something about it. They're taking action. That's where I want my kids to go. And Sherry and I are going next week to talk to some school superintendents and principals. They want us to come talk to their junior and seniors and their parents on, on junior night and senior night and explain this to them so when they get ready to go out and do their college visits, they can look at the Clary reports because it's public information. Anybody can look at those. They can look at those and see how safe that college is. And they understand that zero is not the ideal. We want an honest number up there that says you're addressing the problem. So we feel like that that's a big step forward for us for the high schools to be inviting us in to talk to their juniors and seniors and the parents. Now, if you know someone is assaulted, we talked about this a little bit ago, the first thing you wanna do is make sure they are safe. Make sure if they need first aid, you get them first aid. Get them away from that situation. Get them away from the perpetrator if necessary, but make sure they are safe. That's the first and foremost thing. Nothing else before that. Then you can start addressing some of the other issues. Folks blame themselves when they're attacked, when they're assaulted. They think, maybe it was my fault. Maybe I did something. No. Reassure them it's not their fault. It is never their fault. Never. Be a supportive listener. This is really tough for most people. If you think about just your day-to-day -day life and someone comes to you and they tell you about a problem that they're having, what's the first thing you want to do? You want to try to give them advice on how to fix it. Sometimes they don't need advice. They just need someone to be a listener. No comments, no judgments, just be a listener. Let me tell you what I have to say. Don't offer me any advice. Just be there for me. Just listen. That's really hard for most people because our first instinct is try to tell them how to make it better. Let me tell you what you should do. You should do this. No, just listen. If you witnessed any part of the attack or the assault, stay around. You're going to be supporting the person that was attacked, but you can provide some critical information to law enforcement. Very critical. The person that's been attacked, they're not going to remember all of the fine details. They're in a trauma situation. And it may be days or weeks before some of those pieces start coming back to them. They will not remember what happened immediately. As law enforcement officers, typically we won't do an in-depth interview with a victim until they've had a chance to sleep two sleep cycles. We want them to start that recovery process in their brain before we try to ask them detailed questions about what happened. It's just 
like a jigsaw puzzle with pieces missing, those pieces sometimes will only come back one piece at a time. This week, they can remember two more details. Next week, they may remember one more detail. And that's just how our brains work. So keep in mind, if you saw anything, you could help us to solve that because you weren't the one assaulted. You have information we can use. That's very, very critical for us to have someone that witnessed it that can give us those details. Follow up. Yes, you can be there for them that in the moment. You can even go to the hospital with them if they need to be transported. But what about a week later, three weeks, a month later? If it's not somebody you see on a daily basis, call them. Check on them. Let them know you still care. You want to know how they're doing. Is there anything I can do to help you? So stay in touch with them. That's really, really important. Let them know somebody cares. What about the offenders? Okay. On a college campus, they can have two different things. They can have our investigation that can lead to criminal charges. And what we hope is that we can put them behind bars so they don't do this to someone else. But from the college perspective, they can also be academically sanctioned. The student conduct officer can interim suspend them. They can do an emergency suspension if they're a danger to the rest of campus. They can be suspended from their classes. They can be kicked out of school entirely. Okay. Any number of things can happen on the college campus side through a Title IX investigation, as well as the things that we in law enforcement can do. So they can actually get sanctions from both sides if we can get enough documentation, enough evidence to do this. So we encourage both sides. We want to see that person punished to the fullest extent possible by law and by the academic side of the house. Who should you tell? Obviously, you guys know that I'm going to stand up here and tell you, call us first. Call campus police. That's who you want to talk to first because we can get the first aid there faster than anybody else. We're in radio contact with them. We can get them there quickly. But we want to be able to get that evidence that will help us prosecute the case. We want to help this person if they need to get to a counselor. We want to get them counseling. But all of these folks you could report to, if you're an RA and you get that first, that first few minutes with a victim and they say, no, 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 I, I don't want to talk to the police. I don't want it. Fine. Would you talk to a Title IX coordinator? Would you be willing to talk to a school counselor? Okay. Would you be willing to talk to the housing director? Okay. Who can I get for you that you would be willing to speak with? Any faculty member, is there one of your instructors that you feel close enough to that you could talk about this? A staff member. What about the lady that works in the cafeteria that looks like your grandma and you feel really comfortable talking to her? That may be the one person that this victim opens up to. That may be the one that they feel the most comfortable talking to. So all of your campus staff need to know what to do. They need to know what they should do if out of the blue a victim just opens up to them and says, I was sexually assaulted. They need to know what steps to take, who to call. Okay, On your campuses, Try to make sure that all of those folks are in the loop. That Any questions on that? I want to shift gears just for a moment here. Is anyone familiar with the Circle of Six telephone app? 
this kind of falls under the heading of bystander intervention. Um, taps of your phone, you can get help. What it does, um, I know that it's kind of fuzzy, it's hard to see, but there's an icon of a car. You tap once to open the, the app, then you tap the car as your second tap, and it sends to all six of your friends, come get me. And it gives them the address where you are at that moment. There's another one with a picture of a, a phone handset, okay? If you hit that one, it sends the message to all six friends, call me. So it will send that message to whoever you load, the six people that you load, and it may say, I don't feel safe, call me and let's talk, okay? Whatever you want it to say, you can customize it, but it's a free app that you can use and it will give you some safety with two taps of the phone. There are also, uh, some of you may be aware of the um, nail polish that you can dip your nail into a drink and if it's been laced with a date rape drug, it'll, the fingernail polish will change colors. Well now, there's also a coaster that you can sit your drink on. And what you would do is dip your finger and swipe it on the little test strip on the coaster, and it will tell you if your uh, drink has been tampered with. The coasters come with two test strips, so you can test two drinks, or if you test it as good, and at some point you have to walk away and come back to that same drink, you can test it again on the other strip. So you can do two tests per coaster. So. That are, those are two different ways that you can be safe when you go out. Does, if you are go off campus and get assaulted, you can still come back and talk to your campus police. You can tell us where it happened and we can get the whoever's jurisdiction that is to come to us and we'll be with you. We'll help get that report process started or if necessary, we may take you to them. But either way, we're still willing to help you. That's part of what we do. It doesn't have to happen on campus for us to be able to help you. You're our students, we wanna make sure we're helpful. No, if it happens within our Clary geography, then we report it. Even if it's off campus, if it's still in our Clary geography, we report it. But in the case of, say, Georgia Tech downtown, or even you could use this campus, if you went all the way to downtown Macon to a bar and you're well outside the Clary boundary, we will still help you, but we're, we won't be reporting that because it didn't happen here on this campus. So it would not serve any purpose for us to report that is something that happened that far away. Good question, great question. Does anyone know of any other um, mechanism besides the nail polish and uh, the coasters that you could use for testing drinks and so forth? Have, have you heard of any other applications out there that would help? Mm -hmm. Is that called a padlock? <laughs> mm -hmm. That's very interesting. I have not heard about that one. That's, that's very interesting. There's, there's a company in the um, Pacific Northwest that makes a very small little device, 
and um, it's not much bigger than this Listerine breath spray thing, about this size. And all you do is pull the two pieces apart, and it sets off a loud siren. And it's about 130 decibels, which is about as loud as a fire truck. Okay, It's about this big, and all you have to do is separate the two parts. When you put them back together, it stops. But if you felt unsafe and you had one of these on your keychain, all you got to do is pop it open, and it's, it's deafening. It's so loud. So, um, I think there are, those are about $16, $18 a piece. And if a, a school wanted to buy them in bulk, they could get them for even lower price. But um, they're quite effective at, number one, bringing attention to what's going on with you, but also folks leave. They don't want to be around all that noise and people see what they're doing. So typically an attacker is going to run away if they hear that loud noise. Any, anything else that you can think of that would fall into that category? I want to talk to you guys just a minute about the app called Tinder. I know y'all know what it is. I know you're surprised that this old lady knows what it is. <clears throat> Every single college, without fail, that we're going to, someone comes up to me or sends me an email or sends me a text, but mainly they just straight up come up to us and tell me that they've been sexually assaulted by somebody they met on Tinder. Not one person has came up to me and said, I've been sexually assaulted by someone I met on Match.com. No one has said to me, I've been sexually assaulted by somebody I met on Farmers R Us or whatever that is. I don't know what it is. Um, no one's ever said I've been assaulted off of eHarmony. But they all tell me I've been sexually assaulted by somebody that I met off Tinder. So I started talking with Chief Gammon saying, why? Why this app? Why this one dating app when there are so many dating apps out there? Why Tinder? And yesterday we were working with a group of students and I was talking to them and, and I was, we were talking about Tinder. And one of them said, Miss Sherry, it's free. Ah, maybe that's the, maybe that's the common denominator. It's free. A lot of the other apps you have to pay to be a part of. <clears throat> Chief Gammon is working in investigations right now off of this app. More than one. Armstrong University in Savannah. I'm working with a young lady who was raped off of a, from a date from Tinder. She's getting ready to go to a grand jury with her assault. In most of these cases, the guy is still on Tinder. But if we don't report them, then we have no way to stop them. Now, I'll let Chief Gammon tell you about what they're doing um, with the ones that they're working. I can't tell his story for him, but I'll turn my mic off and let him kind of give you a little brief synopsis of what's going on. Okay, we'll do better. We share a campus with another university, and a student applied to them and was taking classes and was using Tinder and actually assaulted two different females on that campus. Neither one of the females wanted to prosecute so the only recourse that school had was to criminally trespass the person from their campus and say, you can't come back. Being smart, he applied to us for our campus there on their school. 
didn't say I've been charged with sexual assault or I sexually assaulted two people or anything of that. Didn't even say he had a criminal trespass warning against him. He just applied to us. He got accepted. And he was attending classes on our campus there as part of their bigger campus. And one of the victims saw him. So now, once they told that university's uh, police department about it, they're working with our department. We're having to get him emergency suspended from our school before they can take action because they don't want to try to arrest someone when they're, they say, well, I have a right to be here. I'm a student. You can't tell me I can't come on your campus when I'm a student of this other college. So it's really tough when we don't get the victims to prosecute the case. As we said, they will come back time and time again and continue doing this to other students. So right now, as of yesterday, we got him suspended from our school so that now we can arrest him for being on their campus. He can be arrested. So it's, it's been an uphill battle, but we're finally gaining some ground with him. But we're willing to do that. We're willing to take whatever actions we need to to protect our students. And it, it's like I say, if you build a better mouse trap, somebody's going to build a better mouse. So they're going to keep that fight going all the time. So we have to stay on our toes just like the academic side has to stay on their toes. All the Title IX investigators, they have to stay on their toes constantly. And we're working right there with them, hand in hand. One of the girls that I work with at Armstrong, after we spoke, we've been there a couple of times speaking to their student body. And she came up to me afterwards and, and she said, she was telling me about this guy that she met on Tinder. And she said that he wasn't, um, this is not the girl that's going to the grand jury. This is a different one. And she said, he didn't exactly sexually assault me, but I've had trouble on Tinder too. And I said, what do you mean exactly? What you either are or you aren't. What you're either, you can't be kind of pregnant. I mean, you either are or you aren't. And she said, well, he came back to my, um, we went back, we went on a date, and then we went back to my place, and he wanted to do more than I wanted to do. And I said, no, no, I don't want to do that. And so he said, okay. And he stood up beside my bed, jacked off on my bed, and left. And I said, well, what part of that is not sexually assaulting? She said, well, he didn't really do anything to me. Uh, yeah, he did. That's sexual assault. So I want you guys to stop minimizing it. Would that make you uncomfortable? If it makes me uncomfortable, it's wrong. So I want you to be really, really leery and very, very careful with that app because I'm hearing it time and time and time again. So I want you to know that so you can protect yourself. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I think we have become so saturated in our um, environment. We see so much nudity on television. We see so much violence on television um, that we've kind of lost our way and we kind of um, use a broad stroke to define sexual assault. Well, it has to be forced penetration. 
No, it doesn't. If someone comes in my room and does what that young man does, uh, that's sexual assault. And I don't care whether he touched me or not. That's still sexual assault. So I want you to kind of bring, your, bring yourself back to center and I want you to recognize that your value and your worth. And I want you to know that your body is yours and no one has the right to touch it without your consent. And Chief Gammon has this great quote that I always mess up, no matter how hard I try to get it right. I'll mess it up again, but I'll try again. Um, the absence of no does not equal yes. Did I get it right? Woohoo! The absence of no does not equal yes. If I don't physically have the capability to tell you yes, then that's a no. If I don't physically have the capability to tell you no, that's a no. <clears throat> How many of you guys have watched The Hunting Ground? It's on Netflix. Oh, you guys need to watch it. You really need to watch it. When you do, and you see what these other colleges are doing, or better yet, not doing, you will have such a profound respect for Lieutenant Coleman and what she's doing and how she's working so hard on this campus and the Kaufman campus to get to shine a light on this. The only way sexual abuse, sexual assault, incest can survive is in the darkness. That's the only way. And if we shine a light on it, then it can't survive because a perpetrator is gonna flee like a rat. When you, like, ever turned your light on in the kitchen and cockroaches went everywhere? Y'all never lived in Louisiana? <clears throat> Y'all ain't never lived in Louisiana where you turn your light on and cockroaches scatter? <clears throat> That's what a perpetrator's like. You watch when we turn the lights on, when we shine a light on them, they're gone. But we all have to do it together. I can equip you, Lieutenant Coleman can equip you, Chief Gammon can equip you, we can give you the tools, we can give you the insight, we can give you the information, but I can't make you tell somebody. But I want you to know that if you never knew who you could tell, I can tell you three people right now that you can tell. You can tell Lieutenant Coleman, you can tell Chief Gammon, you can tell me. Each and every one of us will believe you. We will point you in the right direction. We will get you the help that you need. We will answer your questions. We will do above and beyond whatever we can do for you. My um, contact information is up there. That's my new website. I'm just so excited that I have a website. Chief Gammon's information is up there. I have my business card here with my number on it and no one answers my phone for me except for me. I don't have a secretary. Um, these have my logo on the outside, but on the inside is my phone number. Okay, so you're free, feel free to take a wristband, feel free to take a business card. Can I answer any questions for you? You're not gonna, you're not gonna embarrass me. If you're here from another college and you would like Chief Gaiman and I to come to your college, we would love to. Um, we also train police officers. Um, police officers, are trained to treat a trauma victim the same way that they treat a robbery victim suspect. And so many police officers and, and college campuses have been gracious enough to allow me to come in and explain to them how a trauma brain does not operate the same as a robbery suspect. Our story changes, we don't fill in all the gaps. Um, so we've been going to colleges training um, campus police as well. Yes, ma'am. First of all, make sure they know you believe them. That's the most important. Um, I have a friend, you guys might have heard me, if you've heard me before, you heard me talk about my friend Nicole. Um, she was sexually, brutally, sexually raped on campus at the University of Arkansas. And she, it took about 72 hours before she finally found the courage to go to the police. Now, the very first thing that the chief of police said to her was, I believe you. That was the very first thing. She has told me those were the most powerful words 
when he believed her. Now, I want you to stop a minute and think, what happened in the 72 hours that passed from the time Nicole was brutally raped till she went to the police? He took a shower. She has all kinds of evidence. She has friends who saw her bloody. She has text messages. She has dates and times and locations. And she had everything. And she chose to pursue charge to, to, to press charges against this young man. Um, she had her court date last November. And the judge said there's not enough evidence to convict him because she showered. She lost her ability to convict because she showered. I know that's the first thing you want to do. I'm, I, and I will tell you guys a secret that I'm not overly proud of, but I am still to this day at 56 years old, a compulsive hand washer. Any idea why? Because I'm still dirty. And I, my abuse stopped when I was 18. And I still compulsively wash my hands because that's the first thing we want to do. So the first thing, back to your question, is I believe you. I believe you. How can I help you? I know Lieutenant Coleman. Will you talk to her? I know she's going to believe you. Let me call the rape crisis line for you. Let me get that crazy blonde-headed lady. I still have her card. Let's get her on the phone. But I believe you. Are you hurt? Do we need to call an ambulance? The very basic things first. And then after that, if she'll, she or he, because you guys, men are sexually assaulted. I don't want you to forget that. Um, can I go to the hospital with you? But then in the days beyond that, st stick close. Are you doing okay? Because there are days we are going to drive the bus off in the ditch because our brain is crazy. Trauma, you guys, does the most insane things to your brain. The thing about your brain is it's going to protect itself. And whatever it cannot protect, it's not going to let you have back. I, I still get flashbacks. And my brain only allows what it knows I can handle and what I can process, and the rest of it stays away. So just stay with them, support them, love them, encourage them. You're going to be okay. Uh, can I walk you to class? Can I, you know, can I go with you to your doctor's appointment? If they have to go back for a, um, you know, a STD follow-up, what can I ride with you? Do you need a ride? Just the, the simple, tiniest little things. But what you can't do is you can't fix it, no matter how hard you want to try. But just knowing that someone is there and just being Anybody else? Yes. Well, you can't force them from not showering. Um, I would very gently and kindly try to walk them through the steps of why it would be best if they didn't shower. Because let me tell you, after you've been sexually assaulted, your brain is not working obviously, or I wouldn't think I could drown in a glass of water. Remind them. I know you feel really dirty, but can I just wrap a blanket around you and let's just leave the clothes on that you have on and I'll wrap a blanket around you and we'll call somebody. Um, I know you want to wash your hands, but when you do, when you wash anything, then you're washing evidence away. Um, they want The first thing they want to do is wash their bedding if it happened in their dorm room that bedding's got vital information on it. You know, if there's um, body fluids on that bedding, then, then Lieutenant Coleman and Chief Gammon can come in and pull that bedding up and they can send that away and do whatever they do to check for evidence. So I, I would just say, let me grab a blanket and I'll wrap it around you. And so that way nobody sees your tattered clothes or your torn clothes or your bloody clothes. My friend Nicole was covered in blood. Um, he jerked her, jerked her head up and, and hit it off the bathroom floor um, and busted open the back of her head. But, but just, you know, if they're going to shower, you can't physically stop them. But if you can just gently say, you know, if, we, if you don't shower, then that's going to help your case. And let's just wrap this 
you know, let me get a, a bedspread out of my room. Don't pull the bedding up off of their bed and, and let's just wrap you up and go. Or let's wrap you up and call somebody. Anybody else? Question for me or Chief Gammon or Lieutenant Coleman? You guys have been great today. Thank you for your time and your attention. And for those of you that I've seen, the familiar faces that I see, it's so good to see you again. For those of you that are new to RAs, thank you for doing what you're doing and being willing to um, put yourself in the position to be the one that someone may tell. And I just want you to be ready. And I want you to know that your reaction is going to be a huge determination in the, in the path that that victim may take. So just be ready, okay? Don't freak out because that's going to be your first instinct. Move beyond that, freak out and say, I, you know what, I got this. I remember. Thank you guys so much.